afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to Correspondent Banking. Where do we go from here now? You know, if I had known that we had this room and this setup, I would have worn my fancy socks. <laughs> <laughs> we live in a global marketplace, and Correspondent Banking has long been considered the backbone of cross-border payments. However, traditional Correspondent Banking is facing significant challenges from its customers, from regulatory compliance burdens, non-bank payment providers such as FinTech, which are not subject to the same level of regulatory scrutiny as the banks are. A March 2017 IMF report indicates that cross-border payments has remained relatively stable in terms of volume and activity, but yet the number of correspondent banking relationships worldwide is decreasing. So while correspondent banking plays a continued, play, continues to play a key role in global trade, we have seen a number of banks scale back or pulling back altogether from correspondent relationships in response to regulatory re uh, compliance concerns, other risks, and, and profit concerns as well. Whether you call it de-risking or re-risking, establishing and or maintaining correspondent banking relationships with foreign financial institutions carry a heavy administrative and compliance burden for U.S. financial institutions. And profitability of such relationships must be considered alongside associated risk. So what are financial institutions doing to face these challenges? How will we adapt to the changing landscape? To answer these questions, we've brought together a panel of experts in the industry to discuss the future of correspondent banking, challenges faced by U.S. banks, global banks, and foreign financial institutions, what impact what impact is fintech, regtech, and new regulations having on correspondent banking, best practices for U.S. banks and foreign financial institutions? We hope to provide some tools and tips. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Ivan Garces. I am the Risk Advisory Service Practice Leader for Kaufman Rawson. To my left, I have Daniel Gutierrez, Vice President, Regulatory Risk Manager with Ocean Bank. Uh, Mr. Gutierrez has been a key part of Ocean Bank's BSA management team which enabled the bank to get out of a deferred prosecution agreement and a consent order and strengthening its BSA program. Prior to Ocean Bank, uh, Danny held various positions, senior level positions, supervisory positions at various financial institutions with respect to their BSA AML OFAC program. And importantly, uh, Mr. Gutierrez is currently the chair of the BSA AML committee for FIBA. Thanks, Ed. To Danny's left, uh, we have Mr. Sean O'Malley. Sean is a Senior Vice President and Chief Investigator of the Financial Intelligence and Investigations Unit within the Enforcement Division at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. In this capacity, he has participated and managed investigations of possible violations of banking and criminal laws and regulations by financial institutions and affiliated parties subject to the jurisdiction of the Federal Reserve. To Sean's left, if I can see that far, we have uh, Gabriel Haddad. Gabrielle is a co-founder and chief operating officer of Sigma Ratings, the world's first non-credit risk rating agency, which focuses on financial crime, governance, and risk management uh, risk in emerging market entities. And lastly, but certainly not least, we have Mr. Andrew Davies. Uh, Mr. Andrew Davies is vice president of global market strategy for financial crime risk management solutions for Fiserv. In this role, he's worked with customers worldwide to design and deploy effective risk management solutions to mitigate financial crime risk with particular focus on compliance, money laundering, and fraud. So I'd like to kick off the panel by first discussing in broad terms the future of correspondent banking as a line of business. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the IMF recently reported that the level of cross-border activity in global payments has remained relatively uh, stable in terms of volume and activity, but yet we're seeing the number of correspondent banking relationships decrease. Andrew, I'd like to start off with you. In your experience servicing banks around the globe and working with uh, these financial institutions, what trends are you seeing in global marketplace? Excellent, thanks Ivan. So I just wanna start off with a couple of banner statements about this business. Um, the number one reason why consumers of financial services do not adopt innovative payment uh, products is a concern about security. And security is a theme that I'll come back to several times during the course of the panel today. Um, the other point I'd like to also sort of introduce is globally financial institutions and, and banks in particular derive around $1.1 trillion in annual revenues, this is a Boston Consulting Group uh, figure, from the provision of payment services. 
We talk about, um, in the context of this, um, uh, this panel, fintech companies, and certainly fintech companies are interested in a portion of those revenues. Now, from a, from a global perspective, I work with financial institutions ar ar you know, around the world, um, helping them protect their customers, protect the, uh, the, uh, uh, the financial institution and the integrity of the financial system itself. So some of the trends I see, so we've ob obviously, we, see we live in a world of increased globalization. There's more international movement of people, of funds, of goods. And I see the, with the introduction of real-time growth settlement systems domestically and with the introduction of real-time growth, uh, really a sort of international mechanisms for providing um, almost instantaneous settlement of, uh, of global payments, um, being a sort of, you know, a trend that everybody's interested in. If you go to the annual SWIFT conference, for example, last year in, uh, in Toronto, ev all of the financial institutions that are exhibiting there are talking about the SWIFT Global Payment Initiative. That provides a very valuable service to uh, consumers of financial services on the wholesale and the retail side, also for, the, uh, for interbank settlement. It's a real um, you know, powerful uh, um, set of tools and, and, and um, services. Of course, associated with those, uh, that, that sort of um, compressed time frames for settlement of payments, um, you know, from um, three days down to you know, what could be minutes, um, for large value transfers globally, that introduces a uh, um, you know value to customers, but also an inherent amount of risk associated with you know are those transactions being you know potentially fraudulent? Are they being used to uh, um, fund terrorist financing? Are they being used to um, to facilitate the movement of funds globally around uh, potential money laundering? So along with that, so we see that, that, that provision of those services being valuable, but having inherent risk that we need to manage. Um, I mentioned also those, sort of, those significant revenues that financial institutions derive from the provision of these services being certainly under scrutiny or under potential attack from other non-traditional payment services providers. The whole infrastructure that is used to provide those services is also um, you know, under review from, um, you know, rather than traditionally where everyone would use the SWIFT network, you know, obviously there are service providers like Ripple that are facilitating the global movement of money. And then the other trend that I see that is sort of interesting and feeds into what we're going to talk about in the, in the panel, particularly around questionnaires um, and, and risk scoring, is you know, it, all financial institutions are interested in deploying risk scoring of all of their relationships, whether that be with a correspondent bank, a vendor, um, the customer, or the customer's customer. So these are all trends that I see occurring within financial institutions and things that people are considering and trying to understand the associated risk associated with those uh, um, you know, services. <coughs> Thank you, Andrew. I think that it's a good, you know, background and certainly lays the context for the remainder of our, of our discussion. You know, we can't talk about the future of correspondent banking without first addressing some of our challenges. Um, you know, and I mentioned at the beginning of our, of, of you know, the, my opening remarks about the heavy administrative and regulatory burdens um, associated with correspondent banking uh, activity. Danny, I'd like to pose you this question as an industry uh, insider is, you know, one of the challenges U.S. banks encounter with, on, with onboarding an FFI and throughout the relationship is the CDD process. And I'd like to get your perspective on, you know, what are the challenges in applying CDD and how will the new beneficial ownership rules impact your CDD process, um, you know, with respect to onboarding and ongoing monitoring of, of correspondent banking activity and relationship? Well, thank you, everybody, and um, thanks, Ivan, for that. Um, as Ivan mentioned before, I'm uh, the chair for FIBA's AML committee, and it's on that uh, function that I'm going to speak today about. Uh, uh, at the FIBA AML committee, we work quarterly to bring issues up, and I'm also part of the advisory uh, committee for this conference, and I'm going to complain to David because I got the panel, I moderated the panel after lunch, and I got the last panel for the closing, se <laughs> closing session today. So, but. Both of these sessions are going to be great, and so, again, happy to be here. CDD, and we've been talking constantly a lot about, about uh, CDD for the past two years, and I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about uh, CDD in terms of, number one, how can CDD affect a financial institution that is a prospect to a U.S. bank, and number two, 
kind of what the U.S. bank is looking for when onboarding that customer prospect, foreign correspondent bank, and their portfolio in their foreign country. So here are some tips and guidances that throughout FIBA's AML committee we have observed across the board that if you're a foreign correspondent bank today in the audience, and thank you for being here again, um, please take note, okay? These are some of the reasons that for CDD purposes, a U.S. bank might say no to your relationship. Um, normally, a U.S. bank will give a foreign correspondent bank some, some allotted time to fulfill the ownership of that bank. For us, it's extremely important to know the ownership of the financial institution or the foreign financial institution, even though the, uh, um, the CDD final rule has put foreign financial institutions on the exempt uh, for CDD if their ownership is declared to their central bank in their, in their home country. But still, that's very important to us. So we give them an allotted amount of time to fulfill who owns your bank. If a bank takes more than 90 days to provide us with that information, most likely the U.S. financial institution would say, okay, well, we may not onboard your relationship. You're taking 90 days. How come you could not give me your full disclosure of your ownership? Number two, if your financial institution is composed of 11,000 other companies, and that's a real case, that would make it extremely hard for me to fulfill my CDD. How am I going to know the ownership of 11,000 companies, in other words, an extremely complex structure of this foreign financial bank? Or how about this? If your foreign financial institution says to you, well, we're owned by a bunch of trusts and paper companies, and you know what? Um, maybe it's my legal department that has to talk to you because not even the BSA officer knows who's behind all those private investment companies, those trusts. That would be a reason for us to say, okay, well, maybe this is an extremely complex structure behind the same. At the same token, um, for example, if the financial institution uh, at the time of onboarding is disclosing ownership information but fails to disclose some negative information about one of the owners of the bank and the U.S. bank through searches and Google and WorldCheck finds the negative information and it was not discussed with the compliance department, that would be a reason for us to say maybe we don't want that relationship. You know, we're going to talk a lot about with Sean and the rest of the panel about transparency here, about trust. I know that trust was something that in the private sector dialogue was mentioned yesterday a lot um, through companies that are right now, like Gabriel's, in the reg tech and fintech industry, uh, trying to help out with all these burdens. But transparency is also something that you know, we have taken note and we've taken best practices and recommendations. In terms of CDD from the foreign financial institutions look at their portfolio and how they're implementing customer due diligence to find out beneficial ownership. One of the things that we have observed throughout many discussions with other AML officers here in the States and by visiting foreign financial institutions is that they disclose, for example, yes, we, we do customer due diligence, but when we go to do transaction testing on some of their files, there is an incredible array of complex structures that the foreign financial institution still has not onboarded or has not gone out to their customer base and kind of gone through the motions of requesting articles of incorporation, operating agreements to determine who their final beneficiaries are. And so that in terms of for us to consider onboarding and monitoring an activity with a type of, uh, of, of their customer like that would be extremely complex in nature. So those are some of the CDD challenges. Um, I, I, I always say at the AML committee we do a lot of work and through webinars as well. Uh, we mentioned at the panel before at uh, two, we said, look, these webinars are great. They bring up all the issues that we're going through here in the United States to the institutions abroad as best practices. Thank you, Danny. Um, 
Sean, Danny's given us kind of an inter, you know, uh, industry perspective on the issues of CDD. Uh, perhaps you can um, weigh in on some of the regulatory expectations um, or an examiner's expectation related to the bank's obligations on CDD of its foreign financial institutions. Uh, sure, Evan. Uh, but before I do, I'm obligated. Uh, I speak for myself, not for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. So um, I, I think what, what you see is that um, some folks are good at, at CDD and others not so good. And, and what, you know, we just had a panel earlier where the Bank of America people started talking about the Wolfsburg, uh, you know, the new questionnaire. And, and I think this is a, a great step in the right direction. Uh, you know, and it talks about different types of risk, talks about geography risks, and, and, and you know, just some of the stuff. I, I, obviously, you want to know if there's correspondent banking, but they talked about PEPs. They're talking about whether your, your customers are arms dealers, atomic power, precious metals, charities, regulated, unregulated, red light districts, marijuana. I mean, I, I think this type of, of, of you know, depth to the uh, customer due diligence is what you need. I'm on the investigation side, so a lot of times what happens is the examiners will come up with a problem and then it'll come to my unit and then we work with the, uh, the examiners, but the board of governors and, 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 and then often with, uh, there might be parallel law enforcement tracks at the same time because we do a lot of anti-money laundering cases and sanction cases and um, you know some of the things we're looking at, it's just huge amounts of money and it's being processed uh, through correspondent accounts and at shell companies. And when we go out and we're trying to find, you know, the, the banks, so we've got a New York bank, a lot of times it's a foreign institution, and they're affiliates, sometimes it's not affiliates, but even quite often it is affiliates, uh, they go back and they'll do requests for information if, if things are very, um, if there's problems, right? That's part of an, any good AML program is you're gonna do your request for information if something has alert that you can't clear. Um, and I can't tell you how many times they come back with just information that there's a fiduciary and you're not getting the ultimate beneficial owner and the, the information's so sketchy. Now, I know being in the US, you know, we've got our own problems, right, with, with our corporations and our Delaware corporations and Wyoming and everything else, but, you know, I, I think what's gonna happen is it's gonna take a while because every, as people update their, their CDD, they're gonna get information that they were missing. And, at, and a lot of times what we're seeing is, right now we're still, the transactions are still dealing with companies that had opened their accounts years ago. Sometimes they were, you know, in a lot of these cases, they were semi-dormant, there wasn't a real lot of activity, and all of a sudden, boom, they're gonna, they're gonna use that account and really start moving a lot of money through. But, there's still a lot of deficiencies, unfortunately, that, that we're seeing in our investigations. Okay, thank you, Sean. I mean, if you may, yeah. I, I wanna ask Sean a question, because this comes up a lot uh, through our travels and, and through our meetings with other foreign correspondent banks mm -hmm. uh, through FIBA. Um, for example, uh, we had someone from Uruguay asking us once, they said, well, my country has legalized marijuana, and you mentioned marijuana, that's why I'm bringing it up. Mm -hmm. um, how, how would you guys view that in terms of a bank in Uruguay, okay, dealing with, in their country, legal, you know, a legal company engaged in marijuana or related business, and that bank having an account with a U.S. financial institution? So I think, I don't know if I'm here, okay. That, I mean, that's, that's part of, the, you know, the questionnaire, right? Uh, you know, are you banking marijuana businesses? I don't know right now if the correspondents fully have a, a good picture as to the risk profile of the customers, uh, you know, of their respondent banks. And I think they're gonna get more clarity uh, from this. I, I think that, you know, we, we always say you don't need to know your customer's customer but in some cases you do, right? And in some cases you need to know the customer's customer if their transaction volume that, are, that, that one of their customers is, is moving through your bank is, is generating alerts, so you have to find out more information. But you also, when you're trying to onboard, you wanna know the risk profile of that, of the, of that respondent 
And part of that risk profile is the type of clientele they have. I, I think one of the biggest risks that, I mean, what you're describing is a very significant risk. And I think that it could end up causing them, uh, you know, they, it could cause them to have to file SARS at a certain point in time. But even more troubling to me is when they don't realize that their respondent is providing correspondent banking services. And, and that risk profile, I think, is, is very underestimated. And Ivan, I think you were talking about the, the number of, 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 of transactions and the volume hasn't really changed, but the number of correspondent accounts has, has been reduced significantly. Latin America is one of those areas. So you know what's happening. I mean, everybody's just getting de-risked and they're not having an account directly with the US correspondent. They're finding another correspondent somewhere else outside the United States that's gonna accept their business. Right. And, and that's harder to monitor, so. By the way, w one of the things that foreign FFIs do correctly, and they do right, is, and it's not in any regulation, or FATF has come up with this, it's not a requirement, but some of the FFIs have shared their portfolio with the U.S. bank and said, here's a list of the customers that we expect to use the correspondent account. And so with that listing, the U.S. bank can do their due diligence. They've included as well financial figures, and I've even seen some that include the names of their suppliers and the jurisdictions where they expect the activity to go. Those type of customers, those type of FFIs, receive less BSA RFIs than the ones that do not provide any information at the time they open the account. So that is something that I suggest anybody in the audience who's listening in who wants to have an account at the US, that's something that is really useful. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Sean. You know, staying on the topic of, of CDD, and I think, you know, this is an important aspect, right? Because you got to get, you got to really understand the risks associated with your, with your foreign correspondent or your, or your foreign respondent banks. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the enhanced questionnaire that Wolfberg put out. I know there was a, a panel on that earlier. But before I do that, I'd like to, I'd like to turn it over to Gabrielle for a second. Um, you know, Gabrielle, you're, you're with Sigma Ratings, a new player in this space, bringing a an, pretty innovative and interesting solution to CDD and customer risk rating. Um, you know, we heard your CEO, Stuart Jones, yesterday provide a brief introduction to what Sigma Ratings is. But, you know, could, could you tell us what you've been hearing from your clients uh, and perhaps the broader marketplace as to what some of these challenges are in the CDD process and the risk rating process? Um, you know, how does Sigma work and, and how can you help financial institutions and those in this room, you know, address some of these challenges? Sure. Thank you so much. I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to hear Stuart speak yesterday, so I'm just going to take a brief minute or two and sort of set the stage so you, you understand who we are and what we do. Um, we're, we're the world's first non-credit risk rating agency. Everyone knows S&P, Moody's, and Fitch, but we're focusing on non-credit. And by non-credit specifically, what we're looking at is financial crime, governance, and management risk in emerging markets. And the idea for Sigma Ratings came from, from Stuart, who, who was here yesterday. He's our CEO and my co-founder uh, during his time working at US Treasury. And he was engaged directly in the de-risking problem. And he wanted to come up with a solution for this. So we, this is a new concept, but it's something that we're bringing to market that we believe has huge potential to really help respondent banks obtain and maintain, maintain their correspondent banking relationships while simultaneously giving correspondent banks a tool that they can use to assist with their ongoing monitoring as well as their onboarding of new customers. So that's, that's just the general premise of what we do. And how we do this is, is we do this in two ways. So we start by collecting publicly available information on entities all over the world. And so this public information can be information we get from annual reports, we get from websites, we get from news and social media. And this information is then displayed on our platform, which we apply our, our advanced algorithms, these are machine learning and AI algorithms, that generate dynamic and predictive risk scores. So you can actually go on our platform, and for those of you who were here yesterday, Stuart, Stuart shared a demo of this platform. You can actually go onto the platform and you can look at any financial institution in the world, and you'll be able to see a risk score on that entity. You'll also be able to see a breakdown of the subscores of that entity and what the drivers of that are based on publicly available information alone. And I'll address why this is really beneficial to some of the challenges in just a moment. 
We then give entities the opportunity to opt in and they can share their private information that we layer on top of anything that's available in the, in the public domain. When this private information is added to what we provide, we are then able to do a deeper dive assessment into the risk of that entity and we are then able to produce a report. And this report looks very similar to a credit rating report, except it's addressing a completely different kind of risk. And the idea is that this report is something that you can use as a respondent. You can use it to look at where you stand today. You can see some of your strengths, some of your weaknesses. You're able to take this to your board. You can take it to your regulators. And, and you can also take it to existing or potential correspondent banking partners anywhere in the world and show them what, where you stand on these types of risks. This is not going to be a replacement for the CDD process, but it is a supplement. And based on the conversations that we've had, and we've had hundreds of conversations with respondent banks and correspondent banks, this is something that, that correspondent banks really, really like, uh, particularly for relationship managers as they're onboarding new customers to help give them some additional comfort in terms of what a bank is doing as well as a standardized approach that they can compare entities versus one another. So just to speak a little bit more to some of these challenges, I would say that, that this is a huge one for correspondent banks. Correspondent banks, they, they struggle when they're onboarding a new relationship to really be able to, perhaps they want to enter a new market, a market that maybe they had to de-risk de from at previously, and now they're, they're looking to re-risk. And they're re-entering that market, and they have no way to, t to tell bank A from bank B within that market. Here, if there's a sigma rating, they'll be able to differentiate between those entities. And that differentiation goes beyond just the country that they're in. Because today, as many of you know, a lot of the, the, the risk has been associated with the country alone. So we're trying to go beyond that to give banks a tool that they can look at the entities at the entity level. Um, another, another thing that our tool really helps assist with is the, the challenge of ongoing monitoring. Today, if you, if you do your, your, your due diligence, you onboard a customer uh, as a correspondent bank, and then depending on the risk of that entity, you might refresh it one year later, three years later, depending on that risk. And you don't have any way to really, on, on, on an ongoing basis, monitor that relationship. And you might have 100 relationships that you have to monitor. And so the constant ongoing monitoring is a huge challenge. So one of the things that our tool provides for is that ongoing monitoring. You can actually get alerts. You can see when there has been a change in the risk uh, <coughs> of an entity. If, the, if the, risk, the risk actually changes on our platform, you'll get an alert for that. And then another, another uh, challenge that correspondent banks face is with, is with KYCC, uh, particularly w with respect to alerts, as Sean mentioned. So what we've seen is, is a huge challenge is that if if there are multiple intermediaries on a wire and, and some of those intermediaries are not customers of the bank, the bank has a real challenge in being able to understand those customers that, are, that they have not done their own due diligence on. So our platform gives, gives them insight and some visibility into the risk of entities that are not their customers. So this is, this is a tool that can be used to address a number of challenges for correspondent banks. And then for the respondent banks, as I already mentioned, but I'd like to dig in a little bit more, this is, this is something that you can really show to your correspondents as, as something that you're using to be really proactive and your willingness to be transparent and open. If you have, if you have good controls and you, to date, have not had anything that, that you're able to use to really, to really showcase that to the world, this is a tool that you can use. You can, you can use this to, to show the things that you're doing, you're doing well um, and also to be open and honest about the, the areas where you might need some improvement. So, so there, I, I've no, n noted a few challenges as well as um, sort of what we're trying to do to address them. Thank you, Gabrielle. One of the other challenges that we're facing in correspondent banking really comes from innovation or, or perhaps lack of innovation or slow to innovation. Um, you know, in the world of global payments, banks have been seen as a trusted financial intermediary generally offering liability, transaction security, high standards, and customer service. Yet traditional global payments, if we've seen them, can be costly, timely, and cumbersome. Enter the opportunity for innovation, okay? Enter FinTech. And the acceleration of technological innovation, including blockchain and virtual payment services, boasting better transaction speeds and lower costs, 
seem to be changing the landscape for global payments and disrupting traditional, the traditional manner in which financial products and services are delivered. Andrew, I'd like to turn to you and ask you, what are you seeing as the impact, or what impact are you seeing from new players such as fintech firms um, and other non-traditional payment service providers or the use of virtual currency and blockchain having on global payments? <clears throat> yeah, it's a, a fascinating transformation of the payment landscape globally, the potential disintermediation of uh, financial serv traditional financial services companies from the, um, uh, not necessarily from the, uh, the processing of payments globally, but certainly from the origination of payments, which can, uh, um, with legislation like the PSD2 in, in Europe, you know, which gives um, fintech companies access to banks, bank data, essentially, you can, uh, they can potentially um, disintermediate the financial institution so that the institution itself is more or less just a pipe for the transactions and the customer relationship is actually managed by the fintech company, which is sort of fascinating. Um, just a, a, in, in the context of those relationships and the context of the, uh, the, uh, the subject that we're talking about today, just wanted to sort of reaffirm some things that uh, you know, my fellow panelists have mentioned. And, and I'm going to call this the four C's that they mentioned that's important. Um, one is currency of information. So Gabrielle just mentioned this in, in um, how financial institutions and, and, and even fintechs can leverage data to manage risk that is current. That's very important because you know, from, certainly from an AML perspective, we see um, um, the currency of information, you know, who who's currently owns or controls a particular um, organization is very important in your ongoing due diligence. Uh, I also meant, uh, Danny mentioned transparency, the need for transparency. Um, that's important, so all of the information that we've got is available. We saw this, you know, with the introduction of the travel rule with, in Fedwire messages and the use of, um, you know, the full disclosure of information, and we'll come to this later around um, things like AMLD4 and AMLD5 around uh, wire transfer, so having all the information available. Uh, we also talked about the, um, uh, um, the sufficiency of the data, so I think Sean mentioned this in the data that we get in the questionnaire from the Wolfsburg Group, getting all of the information that we can appropriately use to manage risk. And then um, something that we'll come back to is the accuracy of the data. And this is the accuracy of the data and using technology to manage the accuracy of the data is something that um, has certainly been a trend. But coming back to the point about around uh, fintechs, I mentioned that idea that you know, there is uh, up front that significant revenues that financial institutions derive from the, the processing of, of, of payments. And certainly one trend that we see is a proliferation of fintech companies that are trying to offer payment services. Now, um, I also mentioned that idea up front of the um, people being concerned about security. Fin people are not as happy to deal with a fintech around their, their um, um, financial relationship um, as they are with a bank. That's one of the sort of differentiators that banks have around security. But certainly um, I see that, the, and, and you'll see this with recent announcements. There was an announcement on uh, Finextra, I think last week, around the large Swiss, uh, Swedish uh, banking group, SEB, um, transferring around $600 million uh, um, over using Ripple. So using technology around um, um, financial transactions that have been encrypted using blockchain and essentially they, them not needing the, uh, the security and the availability that's provided by um, you know, a, a secure network like SWIFT. So the fintech companies are after those revenues. However, what I would say is um, that, that, and they're looking to maintain the customer relationship and in certain jurisdictions like in the European uh, uh, Union, you know, there are regulations that are um, now enacted around PSD2, around you know, financial institutions subject to the approval of, of their customers be, having access to customer data. So they've almost got a little bit of an advantage because they don't have the same compliance obligations. I think Danny sort of mentioned this. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have the same compliance obligations, but let's remember they don't also have the same reputation around maintaining the security of, uh, of, uh, of customer data. Um, so certainly I see f these uh, payment service providers, these fintech companies trying to go after these revenues, but really being um, uh, better served by almost collaborating with financial institutions. So there are some of the trends that we see around you know, fintech entrance into the, uh, the payment services market. Thank you, Andrew. Um, 
you know, I, I struggle with the notion of sending somebody across the room twenty dollars by by text message or or Apple Pay or whatever that is. You know, but we, we must realize that the generation of folks that are coming up a lot are tech savvy. They're demanding. They want instant. Um, uh, you know, information and, and, and process to happen. So innovation is not only inevitable, it's absolutely necessary to continue to compete in the marketplace. Um, Danny, and Sean, this question is to you, is what can U.S. banks and financial institutions do to continue to better compete in this changing landscape? Want me to take that? Please. Thank you. I, I think that... Um, I think that to respond to you, Ivan, what we can offer that perhaps your app can't is the boutique and customization of and, you know, care and training and safety and soundness that perhaps the fintechs cannot or at least perhaps we don't understand yet um, are there, you know, for uh, foreign correspondent banking in the traditional manner, you have folks who you can rely on. There's not a number, you know, if there is uh, an issue, you perhaps have an AML compliance officer in the States to give you tips and guidance, uh, to visit you to do the risk assessments that we all have to do in order for us to show our examiners um, and to comply with law. So, so I think that the, the traditional banking system still has that to offer and will continue to have that. Uh, it's the boutique care again of having someone, instead of you not getting your payment, having uh, or perhaps having a bank send you a letter or something like that saying you've got 60 days to get another relationship and not answering why. So I, I think in short term that. But before, before I let perhaps Sean uh, you know, add to that, I wanted to give additional tips here and guidances that we've learned across the years of dealing with foreign correspondent banks and how this can help maintain healthy relationships across the board. Number one, uh, Andrew, you mentioned the travel rule. The travel rule is something that FinCEN put out, I mean, years ago, and still we see foreign institutions, uh, which by the way are binded by the foreign correspondent bank agreement to comply with the travel rule, but we continue to see foreign financial institutions sending wires without the address. So how am I in the, you know, in the U.S. bank to do due diligence if I don't have that piece of information? Or, for example, we see where the foreign institution would send in wires where, for example, the name on one wire is Ivan Garces, the originator, and then they would put Garces Ivan, and then they would put I dot Alexander Garces. By the way, I don't know if it's your middle name. Anthony. Anthony, Anthony, yeah, almost there. Um, but what happens with that, and it's very simple, what happens with that is the U.S. bank ut utilizes automated systems to pull that information, which is all electronic, and then we paste that onto an Excel spreadsheet and then hit the sort button, and if that information comes that way through the system, I would never know how much Ivan sent me through the foreign correspondent bank because I can't aggregate. The I and the G and the A, it's not going to go together. So a very simple issue such as that could alter uh, the monitoring, could hamper their relationship, could turn into something unusual when uh, indeed it might be as simple as training to key staff in the foreign financial institutions wire transfer department perhaps, or a continuation of, uh, for example, rotation that occurs at that foreign financial institution that the institution is not covering for. Um, again, the names of the originators must be input as issued in their government issued ID, such as you were opening an account, but something as simple as that would, um, would hamper the monitoring of the same. Uh, another example that we have seen is when, for example, there is grouping of wire transfers and, you know, there is this large wire that's unusual. We would see an originator, I'm going to use Ivan, you again as an example, Ivan Garces, $200,000. And when the U.S. Bank would see that, we would say, well, wait a second, normally individuals don't, don't send that amount of money. You know, who is Ivan Garces? And the explanation would come back saying, well, you know what, to save some time, 
uh, you know, Ivan is the president of a company and, uh, you know, there are 10 people that he's helping send money to and it's not one wire, it's there are 10 people behind that wire and we just put Ivan's name on the originator section for quickness and number two, you know, to get stuff done. And, and, and again, that would hamper OFAC scanning and, you know, any additional due diligence that the bank might want to do with Google and WorldCheck. So things like that could turn a relationship sour and please write these, these things down, these are real things. Uh, answering the U.S. bank quickly and timely, you know, RFIs usually tend to have a 10, you know, and then a 2 and or a 3 or a 3 and a 2, like 15 days for replying. Don't reply please on the day 14 because it gives me like half an hour to see all the stuff that you sent in, in response to an RFI or a question. If you're given 15 days, be upfront, reply to the bank on time, and then perhaps get on board with, with, with those kind of issues so that an RFI doesn't start being this whole suspicious or unusual activity and then can turn into the closing of a relationship. So th those are some, some of the examples that I've jotted down throughout discussions and, and, and you know, Sean, I don't know if you want no, to No, I, th I think I'd echo what you're saying. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the first scenario that you described where, you know, you put in a first name, initial, and then you start, uh, you know, mixing the names up, if you've got, uh, you know, it could be a pure mistake in training like you're talking about, but it could be purely an intentional misuse of, of, of the, the, the wire transfer system so that you're thwarting your systems because you, you're acknowledging that that is thwarting it and if they, if they understand how payment systems work, maybe that's why they're doing it on purpose. And, um, you know, who's creating that? Are they pulling it out of a customer profile and that's how they're populating it? Is, is the relationship manager purposely putting the information in incorrectly? I mean, we, we know from our investigations that we've had banks that intentionally uh, stop a wire transfer, don't have straight through processing, and then they repair it. They basically strip out information out of a wire transfer that might be offensive and then run it through the United States so that the payment goes through without being questioned. That's the kind of activity get, that gets uh, institutions prosecuted. And, and we've seen that time and time again. And unfortunately, it's, it's not a one-off, it, and it happens. Uh, it's, I think it's happening a lot less now than ever before, but you, know, you, still have, you could still have a rogue relationship manager. And, and the data integrity that you're talking about, you know, that populates the system if they're missing information, as you were just talking about. Uh, I mean, you know, the whole system is integrated, right? So we're talking about the customer due diligence. Well, why is that important? Because you've got to do a, a risk rating on that customer, and then you've got to be able to monitor, and you're monitoring systems. In many cases, the monitoring system uh, varies depending on the risk profile of the customer, right, and the, and the account number. Well. A lot of the, you know, the, you, a lot of the risk rating goes on uh, what's risky, right? It could be a geography risk, it could be a product risk, it, it could be, you know, just tons of volume coming through. But if you're focusing on geography risk, and I can tell you a lot of banks in the United States focus on geography risk, you need to be able to have populated your entire message. Because if your information is not populated correctly, and they can't monitor correctly, uh, that's the type of thing that all of a sudden, guess who finds it? The regulator finds it when they come in for an exam, and now that bank is at risk of an enforcement action and possibly the look back that folks were talking about earlier. And then those look backs end up resulting in a correspondence uh, payments that had gone through maybe for a couple years without detection that, that didn't have that information, that's going to generate a lot of suspicious activity reports and, and that's going to be the type of thing that catches law enforcement's attention in the United States. So, you know, I think we talked about transparency, transparency and completeness. I think both of them go hand in hand and it's very important. Yeah, just actually, Ivan, just to follow up on something that Sean said there, and I think it's, I, I really sort of characterise this as three layers, and certainly that situation with wire stripping, that can be um, uh, detected if you do some of the things that Sean mentioned there, and there, I, I, really it's three levels of looking at data. 
there's this notion of the integrity of the data throughout its life cycle to make sure it's consistent as you go through each stage. And if there is an anomaly potentially related to wire stripping, then you need to be alerted to that. So really there's that sort of integrity. There's the whole notion of data veracity. Is the data accurate? Is it, is it sufficient and, and, and accurate to, um, you know, within the whole life cycle? And I characterize that whole life cycle as maintaining the data lineage, the veracity, the integrity of the data throughout that life cycle, throughout that data lineage. I've been in to talk about technology and AML programs to financial institutions that have experienced that exact situation where there's been some willful blindness or deliberate manipulation of data. And you're absolutely right. It's almost the law of the universe that the regulators go in and they look and they find that alert where the data in the source systems is not the same as the data in the OFAC monitoring system or the AML monitoring system. And that's a worst case scenario. And, and you know, I, I, that notion that that word look back is really a dirty word in our industry because basically you can say look back equals millions of dollars in terms of a review of uh, activity over time. So maintaining that data lineage, that data integrity and that data veracity is something that you should all consider it as part of your AML program. Hey, I, um, uh, Ivan, I have to do one more here to compliment on, on the discussion. Um, uh, another thing that I think is important for especially banks here from Latin America that are here present, and, and again, thank you for, for being here, but one, one thing that is very important, and we discuss it a lot with foreign prospects, is the fact that in Latin America it's very common for you to have a personal account and use that account for any given reason. Okay, you have a personal account, it's my money. I want to pay whatever I want and I can do that. In the United States, we, have, we don't have a vehicle for personal accounts to be used for commercial activity. So if the US banks start seeing payments from, again, Ivan Garces in big amounts to pay for John Deere because Ivan Garces is buying a tractor in the foreign country, the US bank might, might see that somewhat unusual. We, we don't have that. I don't think there is a a type of vehicle, and I, and I speak to this again and again because I see it a lot. I see it, and it's, it's not because at, at many times, and again, like Sean might correct me, and, and rightfully, it could be used for something unusual, but, but some of this is just uh, idiosyncrasy in, in, in Latin America countries and the manner in which uh, accounts are used and, and somewhat not understood here, here in the States. Okay, thank you, Danny. I mean, I, I think those are all great points, and those are the challenges that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, monitoring, um, you know, account activity for correspondent banks. But I, I, I want to get back to the point or to the notion that I was trying to talk about earlier, which is, you know, how, how can we enhance the customer experience? How can we speed up the process if we can? Um, and, and Andrew, we, you know, we were talking about the SWIFT uh, Global Payments Initiative, um, you know, which aims to reduce settlement time. Can you give us a little bit of background on the SWIFT GPI? You know, discuss how it works. Is this part of the solution? Is it the solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so it's the SWIFT uh, Global Payment Initiative and, and real-time payment initiatives, even domestically with what um, uh, Natura are doing, um, and, and there are, you know, the SPAY network in Mexico, they have real-time payments, we have faster payments in the UK, we have, um, real-time settlement of payments in Singapore, the MPP, the new payment platform in Australia has just gone live. Um, all of these payment infrastructures are, are about providing better, um, a more uh, you know, quicker access to uh, um, the consumers of financial services. At FISA, we have this sort of mantra that is, you know, fi financial services at the speed of life. So the SWIFT Global Payment Initiative is essentially um, a, a, a settlement infrastructure or a way of transferring money globally very rapidly. As I mentioned, um, uh, the uh, really compressing settlement timeframes or payment timeframes down from days to, to literally minutes. I actually had an experience using uh, uh, this uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was actually doing some work with New York Community Bank um, and I'd actually needed to send some money from my Chase account to my parents' Barclays account. So in the morning, got up on a Monday morning, set up a, um, a, a, a payment from my Chase account to their Barclays account, 
By the middle of the afternoon, I was sort of expecting this to take a few days. By the middle of the afternoon, my mother called me and said, thanks, we, we got the money that, that you intended to send. So this was literally intraday I transferred money internationally, something that I was sort of really quite staggered about. So the, the introduction of the GPI is uh, something that is, I think, really valuable to the, the uh, global payment market. And SWIFT have also got this notion of the um, uh, customer security program. So this really came out of that, uh, um, those, those frauds that we saw about two years ago around certain central banks, um, be, uh, um, systems being um, used to initiate fraudulent transactions. Central Bank of Bangladesh, billion dollars potentially uh, at risk. You know, billion dollars is a significant amount of money, so when you think about that in the context of historically something like the Continuous Link Settlement Bank, which was introduced to eliminate Herstat risk, sort of the um, potential risk of the um, um, foreign exchange market collapsing based on you know, that example that we had with Bank Herstat in the, in the 70s, you know, we, we introduced that real-time settlement to eliminate uh, uh, risk. But of course, if a billion dollars goes missing, there is a potential domino effect globally um, so what SWIFT introduced at that point was this customer security program, which is now sort of pari passu, or really sort of hand in hand with um, the Global Payment Initiative, making sure that you're securing those endpoints into, uh, into the network. And I think that, that combination of the provision of these financial services and, and, and settlement uh, times being reduced in a secure way, I think that, that is really the sort of go forward value of some of these networks, particularly the SWIFT network. But it's very much driven by customers and customers' need for the, um, you know, the movement of funds uh, sort of, you know, internationally and rapidly. And one sort of, you know, sort of com uh, side effect that I've seen of the Global Payment Initiative is a reduction um, in the number of letters of credit that you see uh, um, you know, being used, used globally. You, know, you don't need so much of that sort of guarantee that comes with a contract associated with a letter of credit if the, the settlement period is reduced. So I think it's a real value-added uh, value service on the SWIFT network and really supports that notion of international trade and globalization, but also needs to be seen through the context of potential wire stripping, um, fraud risk in real time. So the cadence of the monitoring that you're doing of these for these transactions um, needs to be consistent with the, the settlement time frame. So really you need to do sort of real time monitoring, much like you do for real time monitoring of um, OFAC uh, information within a wire. Even the, um, you know, the, the main systems that people have been using are, are the Fedwire system right now, they've changed the, the profile so that they could add more information so that you could populate it with all your invoice information. You know, you're getting international ACHs, you're getting, uh, they're moving towards same day ACH settlement. So, you know, we're talking about FinTech, but then even the old school uh, systems are trying to reinvent themselves and get a little bit better just to compete, you know? Yeah, and I think the, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve has been very supportive of these initiatives. There's the whole initiative around uh, um, the provision of faster payments, the, the international ACH transactions, and with the, uh, you know, we're now live with um, um, uh, same-day settlement for ACH, incoming and outgoing, and that is a real value-add service that the, um, the, the payment networks have provided for their customers. Uh, the, often, I think, in somewhere like, like the UK, what happened when we introduced faster payments, and, and this isn't happening, I think, in the United States, because I think we're, we've learned from what's happened in the past. In 2008, the, um, um, in the UK, we introduced faster payments. And what happened when we introduced faster payments? There was a massive spike in fraud. So if you look at the figures, 2008, there's a massive spike in, in financial crime, in this case fraud, and we're now not, still not back to, down to the same levels of fraud that we were at pre-faster payments. So I think with people like um, uh, Natcha, the Federal Reserve, they're very much aware of these issues, and, and we're looking at providing um, technology and, and um, information within the network itself to remediate these types of risks as well. So I think, you know, the, I think certainly we're now wiser than we were when we introduced faster payments. But you're right, the, the traditional financial services players have been very proactive in introducing and, and utilizing these types of faster payment uh, networks to provide better services. Gabrielle, I mean, coming from the technology sector, from the, from the you know, reg tech, fintech area, 
you know, what can U.S. banks and their foreign uh, respondents do uh, to continue to, you know, continue to enhance the efficiency and the effectiveness of their cross-border relationships? Sure. I, I just want to make one comment on, on some of these other points about fintech really sure. quickly. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting with the rise of fintech, is, and there is a lot of talk about fintech completely disrupting and replacing correspondent banking. I think that one of the one of the benefits of the of the current system is that is that there is an understanding of what the financial crime compliance obligations are. Whereas a lot of these fintech companies today are really struggling to even understand what their what their responsibilities are and what they need to be doing. I think that this is this is a benefit to the existing system, but it's also, you know, as someone that comes at, in as to some extent a disruptor, right? We, we want to allow for innovation and we want to allow for these, for these new technologies and innovations to come into play. And so I think that there needs to be a, a, some communication and an education for these fintech companies and, and some, some tools that they can use to allow them to really stay on top of what their regulatory requirements are because, because they really, they really are, are struggling right now to, to understand that. If you look at a company like PayPal, that's not, that's not the kind of company that I'm talking about. They have massive compliance teams and they, and, and they really have a handle of this. But some of the new players that are just now entering the space, it's, it's an area for, for risk. And, and we're starting to work with some of these fintech companies and trying to, trying to assist them as well, as a, particularly you know, because we are part of the sector and making sure that, that they, they, know, they know what's going on and what they need to be doing to comply. But that's just one, one thing that I wanted to, wanted to, to raise first. Um, I think that's an excellent point, Gabrielle. I mean, they're newcomers to you know to to the financial services uh, um, market. You know, we it's it's an advantage I think that traditional banking services have, and I certainly look forward to seeing some regulatory guidance aimed at you know the this particular segment of the financial services industry. You know, raising the bar. I think you know protecting fi the financial industry from the risks that are present through some of these um, you know fintech organizations and, and companies. So. Yeah, I, th I think that's a fantastic point, that notion of collaboration, right? I mean, we're all here as professionals in the financial crime risk management area. I think we should all be proud of ourselves and we should collaborate, much like we're sort of mandated to by some of the US legislation, you know, things like, you know, Section 314B, you know, that sort of notion of collaboration. But the other point I'd like to make, which I think is sort of quite ironic in a way, is, you know, what is a, a fintech company? So there, I was just reading a survey from Sellant that there are greater than 4,000 fintech companies around the world at this point. And then I'd also bring to the point that, you know, so I work for a Fortune 500 company that has around $5 billion in annual revenues. Well, we consider ourselves a fintech company. Um, there was a recent interview with the uh, president and CEO of ING, the global bank. They have a trillion dollars in assets under management. Well, what he said, he said, well, it's not ING the bank, it's ING the fintech company. Now, that's sort of great in an interview. But then I was recently at a meeting with ING and they're organizing themselves internally into smaller groups so they can be more entrepreneurial. So it's almost sort of ironic because they're learning from organizations like Gabrielle's organization to be that more entrepreneurial, to really take that innovation and that spirit of innovation into the provision of their services. And to Danny's point, you know, this knowledge that, you know, I mean, some of the examples are just fantastic, aren't they? You know, that's sort of those tips and those empirical examples. Well, learning from that experience and being innovative and and, and collaborating, that's the future of financial services because that's the value that we bring, that security, that innovation and that provision of services rapidly, but all wrapped up into the context of protecting the network, you know, the infrastructure of the financial system itself with professionals like you that are invested in the AML and financial crime risk management space. Thank you. And would you like me to answer your original yes, question? Please. Sure. <laughs> Um, so, so in terms of things that, that, that respondent banks can, can do, what, what we often say is take away every opportunity that a correspondent has to say no. And so we've spoken about a few of those things here. Um, Dan, Danny mentioned, you know, just being, being, making sure that you're honest and, and being transparent. And I think that that, that, is, that is absolutely critical, even if, and Sean and I spoke about this a bit yesterday as well, but even if there is, is something that you, you uncover and you might you know, want to try to hide, that, that to, to be forthcoming about that and to be open about that, that's, that is really, really the, the, 
in, in my opinion, that's, that's the way to go. And that's what we try to, to have people do in term, when, they, when they come and they get their rating is to, to be as transparent as possible and, and to allow that transparency to be a resource and a tool for them. Um, in terms of other things that you can do, I would say that being, being here, being at conferences like, like FIBA, attending training, staying on top of what your regulatory requirements are, engaging with others that really understand those requirements, I think that that's, that's absolutely, absolutely critical. And staying, staying engaged with your regulators, I think that that constant communication with your regulators is, is absolutely uh, a positive thing. And, and making sure that you're, you're, you're open with them on a, on a regular basis. And then really quick plug for Sigma ratings. Come talk to us, find out about a rating, and see how that can be a benefit to you as a respondent um, and, to, and to your bank. Okay. Can I just, while it's on my mind, because you know I'm old and it'll come up, go out of my head in a second. Um, so I think for this market especially, I think what's really important is when we're talking about transparency, a lot of times you might not even realize that you're lacking transparency. Transparency, And, and a, a typical example, which is getting a lot of US law enforcement attention right now, is transactions that going through correspondent accounts uh, in which there's a money service business at the end. It could be another kind of firm, but it's quite often a money service business. And the money service business is listed as the beneficiary and there is no ultimate beneficiary listed on the transaction. That's the type of activity that um, should probably get your correspondent account upset, but it's certainly going to be getting law enforcement upset when they're subpoenaing the account, and all they see is all these wires, and it, and it only shows a money service business. And guess what? Some of these wires might have been directed they might have been directed because U.S. law enforcement runs a lot of undercover operations where they run drug money themselves. So that's how they get their information in many instances. So if they're being asked to, to send a wire transfer and, and direct it to a money service business and they're not putting a party or a corporation or somebody who's supposed to be the ultimate beneficiary, then they know something stinks there. And you as compliance folks should really be on the lookout for that type of scenario because it's bad for your institution and it could get you on the wrong end of a, a law enforcement inquiry. Excellent. I want Excellent. to echo a little bit about what Sean said. Um, it, during the onboarding process for a foreign correspondent bank, typically a U.S. bank will speak to their examiner and would say, well, how, how do you feel about the arena and, and get to some sort of a, an agreement. Um, one of the things that I, that I want to underline is um, if, if you are a U.S. bank and you have a policy not to accept, for example, an MSB, the examiner might say in turn to you, why would you allow to open up a foreign correspondent bank account for a bank in a foreign country that all they do is they bank MSBs? You're allowing them basically to use the account that they have with you to enter the U.S. financial system for something that you have even prohibited to your customer base. And so, you know, I wanted to e echo that. Um, another thing that I, that I think is important, and uh, Gabriel, you, you hinted on that, is uh, certifications. I was just in a panel at 2 o'clock, and, and a lot of the folks there at the panel were, were complimenting FIBA on the two types of certifications that, that FIBA offers, the AML and the CPAML certificate, and how that's viewed. Here, here in the U.S., so that's, that's a plus. If you're out there, uh, FIBA does offer that, uh, those type of certifications and, and training. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we only have a few minutes left, and I wanted to talk about some best practices and some recommendations, but there's, there's two areas in particular I wanted to address. The first one has to deal with risk assessments of the foreign financial institution, and in particular, challenges in risk rating a uh, foreign financial institution who seems on all, you know, in, in, in all senses to be a good institution, good, good programs in place, but just happens to reside in a country of jurisdiction where there is a perceived level um, or, or, or the country's regulatory regime is perceived to be, let's say, weak from either a regulatory supervisory or an, an enforcement perspective. How does that country risk factor into the risk assessment that's made of that foreign financial institution 
How do you overcome it or perhaps even mitigate the risks associated with that perceived weakness? That's a very good question, Ronnie. We Take can start a, with you. All right, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ivan. That, that, that's a very good question. And, and, and we see it a lot here in South Florida, specifically Venezuela is an issue nowadays. Um, in August of last year, uh, there was an executive order with a bunch of sanctions that are issued uh, in dealing with Venezuela. Then in September, FinCEN came out with the advisory of corruption in Venezuela. Um, it, it is extremely hard to manage the risk and the cost benefit of a relationship in a country was such heightened levels of risk. It comes down to a business decision of the bank in terms of is this relationship really worth it? Is it being managed and can we manage it with all these issues that are going on? So, so that, that, that's, that's perhaps one of the, Thank you. one of the matters, yeah. So I'd like to I ask you that, the same question. I think that's right. You know, what Danny's saying is right. And I think even in the prior, uh, I heard somebody, uh, uh, you know, the, I think the Bank of America people were talking about it. When you have a higher risk uh, client or potential client, then you have to look at the revenue stream from that. And, uh, you know, a lower risk client's you might be, accept them with a lower revenue stream. A higher risk client, you may not onboard them unless they're going to be able to have a full complement of business for you because it's just not worth the, their risk on a cost benefit analysis. And one of the things that I've seen in the de-risking scenario is it's, it's, it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg because the, the respondents want to have as many correspondents accounts in the United States as possible. So if they, one gets closed, they can just go use the other one. But for the, for the banks offering correspondent accounts, there's too much time and effort and due diligence expended to, to, to open or keep open a correspondent account that if you're not running enough transactions or, or other types of, 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 of business with them, you know, it's not just correspondent business. It might be FX. There might be all sorts of other business uh, that, that you're doing with them. If there's not enough of that additional business, they might say, hey, even it's not your transactions that are really causing us problems. It's just, it's just not worthwhile from an economic point of view. And that's where I think it skews a lot of the, uh, the analysis because initially they took a harder look because of compl compliance concerns, but they end up jettisoning a lot of these accounts because the economics aren't there. And I think that there's confusion sometimes and they mix the two, so. Can, can I just make one, one comment sort of following up on that? I think that this is a fantastic forum and a fantastic group of people to be talking about what we do about that. Because w uh, that definitely is the case. It isn't just about de-risking, it's de-costing. It's, you know, there are these other, other reasons for people, for entities losing their, their correspondent banking relationships, but what what is a respondent bank supposed to do in that scenario? And what are their, what are their options? And I think that, that there, there are a lot of solutions and we think that we have a piece of that solution, but I think that this is a fantastic forum for us to talk about in more detail and, and think about you know, how, how do we give those respondent banks more, more options and more opportunities to get correspondent banking relationships if, if this is part of the problem. So I just want to throw that out there as we, we don't have enough time to really get into it on this panel, but I think that it's a conversation that needs to be had in more detail because, because you're absolutely right. That definitely is, is, is part of the problem. But I, I think that saying it's part of the problem, it, it only gets us so far. We need, to, we need to be coming up with more and more solutions. And I think just, just one final thought on this. So I think we're, we've sort of moved on from arbitrary de-risking of geographies and particular segments. I think to, to Sean's point, you know, everything should be based on a risk assessment. If we can effectively manage risk using multiple dimensions of characteristics of the relationship, so that's the sort of data that Sigma Ratings has available, you know, rather than single sort of, you know, using a single sort of data point, I think that can better inform the, uh, the risk scoring as you onboard these relationships. And then, you know, if there is potential, if there is sort of justified, uh, you know, business case based on your risk assessment to do, to onboard a particular uh, relationship, 
relationship, then you also can use that information as part of your ongoing due diligence. So inform your, the monitoring of customers that you're doing with those risk scores. And that actually um, it helps uh, do a couple of things. It helps you manage the relationships and the risk effectively. And then it also manages your operational efficiency of any transaction monitoring you're doing. So you get accurate results because it's informed by more than just an arbitrary typology that you're looking for, but that's also the typology is seen through the context of that particular risk relationship. Excellent, thank you. Um, one of the other issues we talked upon, touched upon was payment instructions and issues with transparency of, in the payment instructions. What, what recommendations do you have here for working together with your financial uh, institutions and respondent banks in streamlining that process um, and getting better information, transparency in the payment instructions? Um, I'll actually start at the end, other end with, uh, with Andrew, if you would, and maybe come back this way. Yeah, so, so the completeness of information within the wire instruction is something that uh, is actually being mandated for in, in the European Union uh, um, with um, initiatives around AMLD4 and AMLD5, and particular, the, uh, the mandates around wire transfer too. Now, I was recently at a presentation to a bank in, um, in Arkansas, and um, we were talking to them about AML risk management in, in the context of the USA Patriot Act and the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, and this gives you, give you some context about why I refer to those European uh, um, guidelines. And the, at the end of the presentation, we'd wrapped up, we thought we did a good job, talked about risk from a US context, and then someone at the back of the room put their hand up. We're in uh, Fayetteville in Arkansas, put their hand up and said, can you tell me what the impact of PSD2 will have on the US, the, uh, the, the US financial services market? I was completely flabbergasted, really, that someone would want to talk about that, the, the European legislation, in the context of their domestic uh, financial institution. Well, in, in answer to Ivan's question, this legislation brings in rules around you know, checking the integrity and the accuracy of the data. So is this address an actual legitimate address? So I think with, um, you, know, you know, per the original question, we need to make sure that all the data is there, it's all uh, um, you know, accurate as much as we can use technology to validate the data. And bear in mind that, you know, to my point, legislation around the world sort of tends to float around and migrate. It's like death and taxes, you know, they, they, they don't sort of go away. Um, and certainly legislation that you'll see in the European Union, even around beneficial ownership, that will sort of migrate to other markets in your, your local markets and also the US. So we need to look at this type of data in that context and make sure we've got all of the necessary information to effectively manage risk. Thanks. Anybody else? Do you want to comment um, on that? Well, I, I have two here. Um, Number one, that the FFI would have a very thorough knowledge of the countries that have sanctions. If there's a wire that's sent and it comes through the U.S. bank and it's destined to a country that has comprehensive sanctions, it's going to take longer for that U.S. bank to clear the transaction because the institution would have to review that transaction in accordance to the sanctions. And sometimes those type of sanctions are very complex in nature. We would have to engage, for example, legal counsel to help us out and determine if the transaction can be processed. So again, a thorough knowledge of the countries where there are comprehensive sanctions. Uh, determining also the countries where the FFI's customer portfolio will transact will also help the FFI to clear transactions in a, in a, a quicker, swifter, uh, manner than, than not knowing and then getting RFIs and wires perhaps to be stopped for further review. So those, those are my two recommendations. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add, make sure that if you have a scenario where there's an OFAC uh, rejection, the worst thing that can happen is if the correspondent account, uh, hold, uh, if the correspondent bank sees that transaction come through within the next week or two with the offending information stripped out. And, and that happens all too often. Uh, and it might be that, you know, the relationship manager, it might be somebody in the operations center, the wire, uh, it might be just bad training, uh, but, but it happens too often. And, and that really gets, uh, gets the compliance people escalated at, you, at your correspondent account. And the other thing that we see, uh, uh, not that often, but often enough to be a problem, is the misuse of, of 
the 202 cov where some banks when they want to hide something they process it through a 202 message as if it was a pure bank to bank when there's really should have been processed in the 202 cov or 103 and they're doing it for the express purpose of hiding it sometimes you'll see in in the free text field 70 or 72 on a swift message references to a ffc for further credit or some some other reference that will give you an, an indication that there really is a commercial transaction behind it, not to a bank to bank, be on the lookout for that kind of thing because that kind of, you know, we're talking about being open with your regulator and your correspondent. That's clearly the type of thing that you do if you want the compliance people to shut your account down. One more there, Ivan. And, and, and sorry, but I got one more. You're the one that's holding up the at crowd the, for at the, at the time, <laughs> oh my God, I'm gonna hurry up, 21 seconds. At the time of account opening, ensure, please ensure that you declare to the international department or your business counterparty and to the AML counterparty what to expect in the activity through the account so that the KYC of the foreign correspondent bank is actually updated and we can forecast what will go through the account and what uh, we don't expect to see. Thank so that's, you, that's important. Thank you, Danny. Clearly there are challenges ahead, but there's a future uh, you know, for correspondent banking. We just need to work together. We need to be smart about how we do business. We should embrace innovation and technology. I think we need to be very underst understanding about the risks that are out there. Um, and work collaboratively to, to address the challenges ahead. I'd like to thank you all for participating on this panel. We had some really challenging questions to address. Danny, Sean, Gabrielle, and Andrew, I thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.